You're just too good to be true. Bye, guys. I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, guys, if y'all need me to come somewhere, wherever y'all at, you know, small little fee, I'll come and turn it up. Now sing this. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. You feel like heaven to touch. I want to hold you so much. And long as love has arrived. And I think God, I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. Pardon the way that I stare. There's nothing else to compare. The sight of you makes me weak. There are no words left to speak. So if you feel like I feel, please let me know that it's real. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. That's right. Welcome back, viewers. It's James Calm here, half assed reporter, the guy on the bike. And we're in Chelsea. And we're going to pop into the DC Moore Gallery and see a show. Stay tuned. And we're going to come in and take a strolling close view of an exhibition featuring Teresa. Dadizio titled Reworlding. I'll do a little sweep around the installation. We're going to have a special treat for you. Get it to uh, Teresa to give us a little walking explication of the exhibition. We got Teresa here and uh, you're gonna give us a little guided tour. Sure, yeah. Teresa, okay, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions to start off with. Give us your background. Um, where are you from? Where did you study? I'm from upstate New York. Upstate New York. That's a big place. Yes. Uh, I went to SUNY Purchase and then ah. um, took a few years off and then went to Hunter College. Here in New York City? Here in the city. Okay. Um, so I'm about three, four years out from my graduate. Well, that's pretty impressive to get a... Is this your first one-person show here? It's my second one. Second one, okay. So that's, that's yeah. impressive to uh, have gotten some shows at a beautiful gallery like this yeah. in four years, you said? Yeah. <laughs> so while at Hunter, um, a few things I really picked up on and um, responded to was um, kind of coming out of the Hunter Color School. Um, I'm yes. adding a lot of color theory into my practice, trying ways to kind of revive um, that attention and focus on how color can create space. And okay. Form. Well, uh, we've yeah. actually, we've followed some of the shows at Minus Space. Yeah. Matthew Delegate uh, has a big interest in kind of abstract color paintings. Tell us what the title of this one is. Peacocking, okay. And let me guess, it's about uh, four and a half, so we're saying 54 by 36, something like that. Okay, let's keep moving. Peacocking. And these pieces are all done from the last, in the last year or so? Yeah, I made them in the last year, year and a half. And you're up in the Sharp Valenti's yes. studio program? Most of them while at Sharp. the work I made before, but I think the thing that I really welcomed into my work um, was having larger areas of color space um, because the studios there were just so incredible and spacious. 
um, I could really back up from my work and start to incorporate some of the things that were happening just in the architecture of the studio, the light that comes in, um, the warm and cool shadows, um, finding a way to kind of build these spaces in my work that are both from um, perceiving the outside world, from perception, and then kind of adapted into these other environments that are a little more fictional. And these are all oil on linen? Is that what you're, yeah, you're working with here? Um, I'm also using a good amount of metallic pigment. Um, metallic. Yeah, layering this um, oil in areas where it becomes really thick, and then in some areas, wiping it down so you can see these kind of layered histories. Right, so you're working in not only like body color, but you're also doing some transparent work and uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can sort of see where you kind of wiped out the uh, the red there between the gray stripes and kind of highlights things. Okay, let's keep going. So this is one of the larger pieces in the show. Yeah, this is the largest piece that I have in the show. Um, Next to Seven another. by five, yeah. is that the size? There's another one about the same size, but it's horizontal. Okay. Um, this one is figurative, it's called Sunbather. Um, mostly for this kind of gesture right here, with this form that becomes somewhat anthropomorphic. Um, looks like a figure kind of lounging outside, um, really bright colors, kind of beachy, right? These waves. Um, so there's almost kind of a uh, a humorous take on the whole idea of like the bather and the you know the, <laughs> yeah. the Picasso beach scenes or yeah. something and yeah and a little kind of nod to cubism how the space is fragmented um, and yeah this is this is the one that I used to work on the and you were saying so is this section here kind of the bronze section is that some of the metallic pigment that you're talking yeah, about yeah 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 so that would be metallic and then over here is metallic. And then some of these areas that you're noticing, this repeated motif that's almost like a petal, um, is painted to appear metallic, but is actually yes. just mixed paint. So playing with the idea of what's illusion and what's reality um, in the painting. And that's a lot of fun. Like Trump boy of that. Have you ever uh, considered working with metal leaf? You know, you can get an even more metallic surface with the gold idea. leaf or yeah. silver leaf if you wanted to push that particular yeah. area. Yeah, that's Let's go in the little uh, side gallery. Yeah. Um, I should make a disclaimer here. I think the first time that I bumped into your work and you was at one of the Bushwick Open Studios. A while ago, yeah. So you were saying you've been out of school for about four years. So this probably was about four years ago. I know that uh, they canceled the Bushwick Open Studios for the last couple of years and they just theoretically sort of had it last weekend and then uh, I was kind of reintroduced to you because <laughs> should I mention this <laughs> you're, you're engaged to one of my my painter buddies Greg Lindquist and so uh, through him I uh, got to go to your studio when you had an open studio thing at the uh, Valentis sharp Valentis thing maybe six or eight months ago something like that Let's talk a little bit about your ideas about abstraction. Sure. You know, you were saying that you had this piece that we just looked at was kind of a figurative study, kind of a cubistic beach scene or something like this. Some of these other pieces, and we talked a little bit about this. You actually came by for a studio visit at my place. We talked a little bit about it. The, um, some of the trends that are happening in abstraction these days. And I happen to mention that uh, I thought there were a lot of painters, uh, especially female painters, that were kind of uh, picking up the, the legacy of like people like Hilma Alfklint mm -hmm. and Agnes Pelton. I think they would probably call it some kind of maybe transcendental, or transcendental abstraction. 
Uh, there was a group that's been doing things like that called Helma's Ghost. A couple of ladies have teamed up and are doing projects. But you were kind of saying that you didn't really feel yourself was part of that, but you were involved more with the ideas of some of these more decorative things like Art Deco and Art Nouveau, things like that. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I would maybe backtrack a little and say okay. that some of the influences um, that I carry along in my work are definitely um, Helma F. Klimt. Sure. I'm also thinking about like Sonia Dulani as well, Georgia O'Keeffe. So, um, it's a wonderful legacy to be yeah, working with. For me, they invite in is the opportunity to mix different visual languages and not yes. so adhere to a specific orthodoxy where I can have volume, I can have like a lushness of a painted surface, and I can also have the flatness of space. Um, and so maybe some of these practices often done by women that were at one point kind of in the margins are coming back around because there's so much richness to kind of reinvestigate in their work. Absolutely. Um, also, we were talking a little bit about, <clears throat> we were talking about Art Deco, Art Nouveau, those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Are you also like uh, conscious and thinking about some of the pattern decorative painters? You mentioned the uh, Hunter Color School people and a lot of the stuff that they were doing was kind of running contemporaneously with the pattern decorative painters back in the, I guess it would be like the mid 70s, something like that. And I know that some of your pieces have got more pattern things in there. Are you like thinking about uh, the pattern decorative artists at all? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, I think it kind of just comes out of my work um, naturally a little bit, just based off of my interest, um, you know, like you mentioned, I mentioned before in a conversation about Art Nouveau, this kind of yes. pairing of these um, kind of architectural synthetic forms with biological forms, um, which could be considered a kind of biological romanticism. Um, but then when you take something that you look at in the world and reduce it to kind of a simple language, you start to create patterns. Um, and so for me, it's just been a really kind of productive um, territory to investigate in my practice. And, uh, I love the, um, the richness of the simple contrast of the blue and the yellow here, and you really are using a whole uh, spectrum of the blues and also another spectrum of the, the yellows, kind of yeah. fading into the golds and even into the browns. See, when I was talking about some of the um, transcendental painters, I think some of the things that you're using, like the symmetry, mm -hmm. a lot of the um, gradient color fades and things like that, are devices that they used as well. But that, I'm, do you feel like, I mean, <laughs> Kandinsky was writing about spiritualism and art from the beginning. Do you feel that there is some kind of a maybe spiritual thing in, in just abstract painting in general, or would you like to keep it on more of a... I think there is a way that artists relate to the specificities of a shape or a form and imbue it with meaning. That you can okay. to a sense of um, spiritualism, because you're communicating a feeling, um, and maybe not necessarily a thing or an object. Um, and so what that, what that thing is, um, it's very much a kind of internal experience, like a spiritual experience, maybe. Right, I think that <laughs> it's, the whole spiritual thing kind of, it bumps up against the, uh, the platonic idea of the world of forms and all these other things, and, uh, and geometry is part of that as well. Okay, let's uh, run over here and we can... Uh, catch the rest of the show that's in this little, this other gallery. I also think that the, uh, the installation is beautiful. Thank you. I think this is kind of an example of what I was talking about when I was mentioning the pattern decorative influences. Yeah, definitely becomes um, a lot more patterned than some of the other pieces because there's a little more space for 
Yes. drop shadows so a lot of my work has like a patterning or a symmetry that like, is intentionally broken or right there's just a little, certain discordance in there where you think you're saying something and then you stop and look and you go no this is this is not right. lining up straight yeah yeah i'm kind of thinking about it like fragmentation or almost like um glitching that happens um just when you look at an image on a screen so playing with like what's natural what's um, biological and then what becomes kind of mediated through right. technology and that way that we relate to the natural world is very much how that is shifting because we're always behind a screen. Have you have you read any of the work by Hito Styrel, I think is her name? Yeah. yeah. You know, she has something about the <laughs> the pathetic screen or something like that, about how in certain ways it relates to Walter Benjamin and his idea of the um, work of art in the mechanical age of mechanical reproduction, but she's sort of talking about the work of art in the age of, of the computer screen and how images break down mm -hmm. after it's been reproduced or digitized a dozen times. Yeah. And that kind of brings up your point of the kind of the degrading or the, the breaking up of discordant images that you're pasting together here. Yeah. very different read when you get close to the work where yes. it becomes actually really painterly and I'm using all of these painterly techniques. You can see um, the drawing underneath. You can see the brush strokes. Well, I like that, that you're thickness. keeping the kind of the sign of the hand. There's a, right. a couple of smudges here and there. It's not too perfect, but it's mm -hmm. it shows you that it's really handmade. And I think that's also one of the things I like about um, the pattern decorative people was that they they always wanted to kind of show you the, the scruffy side of things, no matter how perfect you could do it. And that's the great thing about handmade things as opposed to uh, machine-made artifacts. Also, why don't you talk a little bit about your colors? Yeah. You know, you always just kind of uh, tone down tertiary colors, uh, kind of soft and... Uh, not what you would expect. Uh, okay, so what would you even call that color? Is that kind of a <laughs> That's, uh, violet gray? Violet, yeah, actually it was a violet gray. I forgot which pigment. I actually used to make the painting. Um, and then I used the violet gray to make the painting. A lot of my palette comes from the kind of meticulous uh, structuring of color relationships through, um, you know, kind of my experience learning and teaching color theory. Um, and then there's like a formula I use to a point, and then after that, I allow the color to be really intuitive. So I leave gaps intentionally so that I'm responding to these structures. So a lot of the color is, you know, I have it planned out, but then I'll leave one area where it's kind of a question mark. What other hue can I put in this space that feels like it both belongs there and can also create a whole new environment. Um, I think for this one, it might have been um, this like red that's really kind of sparse. You see it down here a little bit yes. there, but nowhere else. Um, to kind of just like anchor the piece or give it this unworldly sense of light. Also, you're doing a lot of things with your, your brush strokes and little striations and things in there. So there's a lot of um, attention to the, excuse me, the painterly aspects of this. Let's go down here. And you're always kind of uh, emphasizing, you know, the various types of brushwork and the like you're talking about layering things and uh, wiping things away. certain amount of pedimedi. Also, I like the, um, what you're talking about of the abstract things played off against things that are kind of realistic, although this central form is kind of abstract. It could be a piece of foil that's been cut and curled and sort of the way that these light 
where the shades kind of roll over the surface could be reflections of something. Right. And there are other parts where you're doing other kinds of things, kind of taking a little bit of nature, maybe cutting it out and <laughs> almost like being a collagist and putting it back into something. Yeah, and you're probably noticing a lot of the kind of axial splits or the harder edges between um, different quadrants within the compositions. So I was definitely using um, collage techniques and thinking about the ways collaging, um, slicing up of images also relates to this kind of biomorphic um, aspect in the paintings and how as humans we are like tampering with nature. So kind of embodying that process through the compositions, through slicing them, dividing them, reconfiguring them. Okay, we're going to wrap up looking at a couple of pieces over here. Let's start out looking at this smaller piece. Okay, so this is actually an example of something that is not symmetrical. And it looks like you had a lot of fun dealing with the color things on this going from, a, I guess it would be almost a cobalt blue over to a powdery turquoise on one side, and then you've got uh, yeah, the browns and yellows on I shifting into the other side. I think this is an oppression blue down to an ultramarine blue. So it changes as it gets darker in value. Um, and then also using um, like green gold or certain pigments, mixing them down um, into a kind of blue purple. <laughs> so there's a lot that's like properties that's being shared between these two hues as they get darker in value um, to kind of make it feel like it's a volumetric form. Right, I, I like that kind of the the illusion of overlapping planes and mm -hmm. things like that. Okay, so we'll wrap up looking at this piece. What's the title on this? This one is Ice Blue. Um, Ice Blue? Ice Blue. Okay. And it was made this past winter when we had a really big snowstorm. Um, and I was looking out of my window and noticing like those beautiful icicles or ice crystals melting. This is when you're down in Dumbo? Down in Dumbo, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> looking out on the East River and all that beautiful yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, okay, so here we've even got some little Blazing. teardrops kind of yeah. dripping off there. See, that's one of the great things. You could be very flat and, like I saying, kind of cubistic, but then you're throwing in these kind of almost trompe l'oeil elements. How about the scale? You know, a lot of people that work abstractly feel, especially in the New York school, they feel like I've got to make paintings that are 10 by 14 feet, something like that. Most of these pieces I would consider personal size, wall yeah. size, you know. Yeah. They're definitely about the size of, of my body as I'm painting them, kind of minus my legs, right? So it's a very kind of human scale for me. Um, and then the composition reflects that sense of portraiture as well, the kind of frontality, the opening up, um, how they're divided almost as if they have a top, a middle, and a bottom. And I was thinking that that piece is probably the other second, the se second large piece in the show. Okay, Teresa, thank you so much for giving us a chance to uh, come in and talk to you about the show. Congratulations. What was the title of it again? Reworlding. Reworlding. You're going to give us a comment or two about what that means, reworlding. You said a little bit about the nat natural world and... based off of how we're kind of tampering with it. Right, our artificial world being stuffed into and pushed into the, to the natural world. Okay, thank you. Let me do my little wrap up here. So this has been James Com reporting on 
Teresa D'Addazio reworlding here at DC Moore Gallery. I'd like to thank Teresa for her little chat. You can like this, share, link it up to all your websites and social media, and you can subscribe. And you can leave your thoughts, ideas, comments, criticisms, and reviews below. And in our 18th year, we just ask you, as always, to say, thank you, Kate. Baby, don't let me